Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Henry Parks, if he's remembered at all, is known as the father of Federation. The Times of London described him as the most commanding figure in Australian politics, a colonial colossus. A liberal and radical of his day, he served as Premier of New South Wales five times, but sadly didn't live to see the Federation of the Australian Colonies in 1901. Today, I'm joined by author of Sir Henry Parks, The Australian Colossus, Stephen Dando Collins, to talk about Parks, his life and his enduring contribution to the establishment of the Commonwealth of Australia. Welcome to the Afternoon Light podcast, Stephen. Thank you, Georgina. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here from the Tamar Valley, you lucky thing, but glad you're enjoying the delights of Melbourne town. Absolutely. (laughs) So, Stephen, I think you will appreciate, and it is a sad fact, that probably not many Australians, let alone people around the world, know much about Henry Parks. Can you tell me a bit about his upbringing and the start of his life, which was, of course, not in Australia? No, he was uh, born in Warwickshire, outside Birmingham. And had a very tough life, went to school until he was eight. But his father got into financial strife, ended up in debtor's prison at one point. And so young Henry had to leave school and go out and work for a living. One of the first jobs he did was working in a rope factory where he would take strands of hemp and bind them up and create rope. And for an eight-year-old boy, I couldn't imagine me doing it myself. He did this for several years. He worked on the roads as a 10-year-old, cracking, smashing gravel to make the road gravel and so on. When he was 11, going on 12, his father's situation improved a little and he was sent back to school. Well, pay because he had this yearning for learning. But he was only there for three months and dad went into financial strife yet again. And so he had to go out and start earning a living. So he became an apprentice turner of ivory and bone. And there aren't that many turners of ivory and bone these days. No. But they made all sorts but of But I things. think it might be banned. Oh, certainly yes. ivory. Yes. Ivory, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he made things like walking sticks and candlesticks. It was commonplace in those days for those sorts of items to be made from ivory and bone. Ivory, of course, it was quite expensive. So if you had an yes. ivory walking stick, you were doing well. So he did his apprenticeship and proved to do well and decided he'd go out on his own in Birmingham and had just married his, proved to be his first wife. Now, I should throw in that Henry had three wives, yes. 17 children, and his last child was born when he was 78. Yeah. I think his third wife and final wife, wasn't she 60 years younger than him or something His like second that? wife was 23 when he made her his mistress. Oh. She died at 38 but gave him five children in the intervening period and his third wife was 23 when he married her. Yeah. He had an eye for the ladies but the ladies had an eye for him. Yes. It's interesting, isn't it? People might not be very familiar with – his story, but I think they'd be familiar with his portrait and his photograph. You've seen a very, very big, big sort of almost Father Christmas-like I, I, beard. I describe him as looking grumpy Father Christmas, yes. Yeah, yeah. One wonders. He, he was very popular with men too. His enemies were fervent, but at one stage he was given the nickname G-O-M, which stood for Grand Old Man. Not Grumpy Old Man. No, oh, yeah. and he was revered by his followers. So he had this quality, charisma, but indefinable. You couldn't bottle it. So, yes, a very interesting gentleman. And I say that early in his career, the follies of youth followed him and in a later life, the foolishness of old age. But in that intervening period, he was an amazing man. He did straps. I note that he was born on the Stonely Abbey estate near Stratford-upon-Avon, which, of course, is Shakespeare land. Yeah. Did that ever influence him, living in a place where Shakespeare had lived? And obviously you've got a lot of beautiful plays being put on in the Globe Theatre. Was that part of, I guess, his interest in learning and reading? Interestingly, he became a poet himself and considered himself a writer. And he had some of the greatest writers of the age as his friends. Lord Tennyson was a close friend and she would send him his poetry and Lord Tennyson would write back very complimentary letters. I'm told by people who know a little bit about Park's poetry, which was dreadful, but <laughs> he was an earnest poet. But Mark Twain was a friend, Charles Dickens was a friend, and they would correspond regularly. And one of his hobbies was to collect the letters and autographs when it wasn't a thing of all these famous people. Thomas Carlyle, the famous British historian, close friend. 
How many politicians in Australia today, prime ministers even, can reel off this list of Nobel Prize winning authors or whatever who have that among their personal friends? It's astonishing. Astonishing is the word. So his paper, we're sort of running way ahead of ourselves here, but his papers are um, at the, is it the Mitchell Mitchell Library Mitchell Library in, Mm. in Sydney? Now, are these autographs of all these famous men? No. Uh, oh, um, that's disappointing. So one of the – maybe it's a spoiler, I won't put it in exact details, but like his dad, Sir Henry all through his life had financial troubles and he saved this collection of his autographs and, and letters for um, years and years and years and only right at the very end in the last year of his life he sold them for I think it was 16 shillings, which was not a lot of money. Right. Today they'd be worth, I don't know, maybe millions, but certainly hundreds of thousands. And they were lost. We don't know where they were. We don't know who bought them. Oh, that's disappointing. So Henry Parks is in Birmingham. He's an ivory and bone turner. Yep. And he is married to Clorinda. Clorinda. And they decide to move to the colony of New South Wales. It's almost forced on them. He moves to London after he goes into business in Birmingham, opens a shop for a year, 18 months, and goes broke. Surprise, surprise. (laughs) Yes, yeah. So they move to London to try to get work. He's always had a fascination with the United States. He's read a lot about them. Self-taught, and he would get books from the Mechanics Institute and read voraciously, particularly about the US. And so his initial plan was to move to the United States. But how is he going to finance this? They're so poor that he and his new wife are renting a room from a pair of elderly sisters who have to give them a glass of wine and a piece of Christmas cake for their Christmas because that's all they've are going to have for yeah, that Christmas. And then he hears that there's such a thing as bounty immigration to New South Wales. There are two classes of migrants at that stage. If you qualified for the first grade, you went out paid for by the government. Second grade, as a bounty migrant, you went out, but you had to have a certain skill. And because he was a journeyman, he had his papers as a, a turner. You have his passage and his wife's passage, steerage class out to Australia, but he had to find work within a prescribed period. Right. There's a possibility you could be sent back if you didn't. And nothing like that was being offered to America. So uh, they signed up and out they came. Amazing. And he quickly found work, didn't he? Not initially. All the others around him were dairymaids, people with rural skills yes. or tradesmen, and they're being taken off their ship, which is sitting out in the harbour. They're not allowed to stay in the town. They can come ashore during the day, but they have to go back to the ship. And everybody's getting work. But in areas where they were needed at the time in New South Wales, it was mostly in agriculture and grazing. So finally he took a job on the estate, a wealthy landowner, as a labourer. He didn't want to do it. He hated it. And so that set him up. And then he moved into Sydney a little later and he decided that initially he would be a turner of ivory and wood again, but he opened a shop selling novelties. Now, Sir Henry was a visionary in so many areas, but his idea of what people would want to buy was dreadful throughout his life. And he kept (laughs) ordering. He had 400 different suppliers in England. His sister was his agent and he became very enamoured with the idea that he was going to rival the later Mark Foy's and so on, the big department stores with his store in Sydney. And uh, he opened branches at one point. He had a branch in uh, Geelong. Another point, he had a branch in Wollongong. And And these were toy shops, weren't they? Basically, yes, yeah. yeah. And they weren't essentials. The only good thing he did, his latest shop, H Parks and Company, it was in a rented premises near a central station in Sydney. This is quite a way ahead now because he arrived in 1839 and you know, the railway started to take off 1850s, 1860s. But by that stage, so location, 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 that was the place to be because central station, everyone would pour into the city during the day from the country and the suburbs and they would want to go shopping. So the Mark Foy's and so on built in that area. It was only later the Sydney – CBD moved towards uh, Circular Quay, but in those days, Circular Quay was just a very industrial area. So Henry at least chose the right place, but he had the wrong products. <laughs> but he had this fascination with politics. Yes. So tell me about how he gets into colonial politics. Well, he started out in England, attending every meeting that was going. At this stage in Birmingham, when he was early 20s, Birmingham had a population of 190,000, but one of their political meetings attracted a crowd of 250,000 people because there was so so much reform being called for. The vote for everybody at that point was restricted. You had to be a property holder, owner, and you had to have so much money before you could get the vote and this sort of thing. So he went along and saw all sorts of interesting speakers, and he was absolutely fired up. One of them was William Cobbett, and William Cobbett 
I found out my mother used to say, oh, you realise that we're related to William Cobbett. Her grandmother always said that, yes, I thought, I think so, because my grandfather said that we were related to the founder of Hobart Town. On my grandfather's side, we were convicts, pure and simple. Oh, but exciting. It, but it turns out we, <laughs> we were related to William Cobbett. William Cobbett was a great, not a rabble rouser, but a great speaker. He became a member of parliament. He wrote many books and he was all for, for change but in the wrong areas. And also he stood up for the little man. He's actually, he was a racist. He was against the abolition of slavery. He was against the industrial revolutions, new innovations that would put men out of work. Threshing machines. Was he a Luddite? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. But he was very popular because he's speaking for us. Yes. So what was Henry Parks's politics then that was being formed in Birmingham and then once he moved to the for, colony of New South Wales formed? Very liberal. Involved? Yes. But not liberal as we talk about it in the Liberal Party in Australia right. today. Liberal as in… Radical. Uh, reform, change, yes. change. Yeah. So he up- wasn't associated with organised labour, the sort of trade union No, that was, that, was, that was yet to come. No. He was very focused on deprivations with respect to children. And, oh, absolutely, and because he'd gone through this. Society. Like yeah. Dickens. This is why they became friends. They shared background. Yeah, Dickens also at the age of eight is working in a, a shoe blacking factory. So um, they had much in common. Yeah. Let's look after the common man, not the rich man. So he gets involved in all these political movements in Sydney, but he moves around. One stage, he gets involved with a local reverend who's advocating. So we're talking 1850, Mm. the great federated Australian Republic. He's talking about in 1850. And Henry says, oh, yes, I'll be in that. Yeah. So he gets So he's a Republican. Well, for a year or two. For a moment. Yes. And (laughs) then there's another chap who says, I think we should have an Australian aristocracy. Let's have a Duke of Wagga Wagga and an Earl of Wollongong. Oh, yeah, I'll be in that. The Bunyip aristocracy it was called, wasn't it? (laughs) So Henry, in his early years, early 20s into his 30s, was very fluid. If it was being spoken about, he wanted to be involved in it. So he would have these uh, meetings at home, you know, dinner parties, if you will, with all these like minds, like minded gentlemen, talking about all the political changes that they wanted to see for Australia. It's amazing. At this stage, 1850s, when he's first is elected to the Legislative Assembly in New South Wales, New South Wales is not even 75 years old, and they're talking about it's a colony, a British colony, with a British governor, but they're talking about the nation of Australia even in those early days. Yeah. Another thing I thought was interesting is he was involved in 1849 in opposing more convicts being transported oh, to Australia. Absolutely. Can you tell me about this movement in New South Wales, and we, obviously this is pre-Commonwealth of Australia time, where people were saying, okay, we've settled here, that we've had the transportation ships, but now the free settlers are settling here and we're not going to be the depository of the bad people of England anymore. We want to be a country built on free settlers who are here to make good with their lives and for their children and we don't want the troublemakers anymore. You can't deposit them on us. You can't dump your rubbish here. (laughs) Yeah, dump your rubbish. Uh, And some of the people saying this, ex-convicts themselves, but who have done well, made good. But interestingly, a lot of convicts, once they'd served their time, went back to Britain and Ireland. A lot of the history books don't tell you this. It was assumed that they all stayed here, but no one's ever been able to put a figure on it. But those that did stay and those that were starting to be born here, the Australianness of Australia is starting to be formed from the 1850s on, and they're saying, we don't want British uh, convicts sent out here. So the movement was successful in New South Wales, eventually Tasmania, where I was born, and, and live once more after being away for many, many years. In 1846, the population of Tasmania was 70,000, of whom 29,000 were serving convicts. Right. Well, it wasn't anywhere near as strong in New South Wales. And in fact, Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land as it was until 1856. They changed the name deliberately to get rid of that convict slur uh, to Tasmania. Yeah. But So Tasmania was the last colony to have convicts sent out. So Henry was on the right side in New South Wales in the 1840s. The transportation was ceased to New South Wales. And what was the basis of his opposition for opposition to transportation? The same thing, that we don't want the rabble. Yeah. yeah we don't. Yeah. Because, but there was a sense, wasn't there, that the convicts were providing free labour and this would undercut the wages of the New South Welsh men and women who were seeking employment and if they were competing against someone who was free because they were well. a convict, exactly. then their wages certainly weren't going to be elevated. In the 1820s and 1830s, assigned servants, free assigned servants, in mm. effect slave labour, yes. was the backbone of the development of the Australian colonies. But as you say, people like these bounty migrants, why would we go out there 
if we can't get work. And that was one of the reasons for the bounty system. You've got to find work here yeah. and not just arrive in the expectation or hope that you'll find work. So Parks has established this novelty shop, the toy shops, with varying degrees of success, but he becomes a newspaper man, doesn't he? Now that he's very much involved in politics, he runs the campaign, elected to Sydney Council, and he's starting thinking seriously about in the 1840s, the New South Wales are starting the system where now they will be not appointed members of parliament but elected. Oh, I might stand myself. Now, he was a free trader mm. from his early days in England, and Richard Cobden was his big hero. He was a free trader in the UK. He always wanted customs duties abolished in the UK. It never happened, not long term. Sir Henry, as he is now, was a free trader all his life. So this was really his main political platform. And he says the free trade movement, there wasn't really one, needs a voice. So I'll create a newspaper and it was the Empire. Yes. His big rival was the Sydney Morning Herald run by John Fairfax, who just like Parks was from Warwickshire. They hadn't known each other previously, but Fairfax was a businessman and he had several partners who were very good businessmen. And so the Sydney Morning Herald ran at a profit and the Empire ran at a loss consistently. And friends and supporters, particularly of his same political persuasion, would put money in. And But after eight years, the Empire folds. By that stage, he's been elected to the lower house in New South Wales, but because he's insolvent, he has to resign his seat. And Henry goes bankrupt three times, personally bankrupt three times in his career. In today's sort of follows in his father's footsteps, Absolutely. doesn't he? Yeah. Does yeah. he not take it very seriously? Is that why, do you think? Well, Banjo Patterson said, uh, who knew him, said he um, despised money. I don't think he despised money. He despised thinking about money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got these other things to do. It should take care of itself. So mm. while he's running the empire, his shop is still going and he's got puts a manager in and, of course, the managers are hopeless. But then he has a printer's strike at the empire and he's all for the working man, but the working man is threatening to walk out unless he gives them a raise, I should say. And he takes them to court. Very unlike Sir Henry. This stain stays with him for the rest of his days. The empire is all about for the working man. The Sydney Morning Herald is all about for the squatocracy and takes these 17 men to court, has them convicted of conspiracy. And all they were doing, they had a chapter, a union, very early formation of a union, but they threatened if you don't give us this rise, we walk out tonight mm. and put your paper at jeopardy. So he was so incensed by this. So they're convicted and the 17 of them are seven, sent to jail for between 24 hours and 30 days, his own men. And he imports 35 replacements, 10 from the UK, 25 Eurasians from Madras in India. So this hangs around his neck like an albatross for the rest of his political career. You say you're for the common man, you sent the common man to, to prison mm, for to opposing prison. you. And also in a time when White Australia was the mm. predominant view. Gee, Bringing in foreign later. labour mm. and non-white labour mm. would have been pretty controversial as Very well. Much so. yeah. Very much so. Very much so. But they were cheap. What was his view on White Australia? Did you? Did L- later in his career, there was a strong White Australia movement. Yes. Edmund Barton, the first Prime Minister, brought in the White Australia Act, I think it was. But it was certainly the White Australia policy. And Parks, in the end, he felt there was – this talk of the yellow peril was it was even being talked about in the 1880s, 1890s. When you think about it, in 1850s, 1860s, one-fifth of the male population of Victoria during the gold rush were from China. Yes. But many of them went back again. And there was this fear that they were going to take over the country. So, yes, he was a supporter of white Australia policy. Which was uncontroversial at the time, let's oh, be honest. Most people were. Absolutely. Tell me about his personality. He's quite a... Curious person, isn't he? Although when, as I have done these podcasts, when you read about his character, it actually is quite familiar. Quite a lot of them have similar tendencies. I was thinking of Doc Evert and you know, yes, people who yes, have yes, yes. sort of the highs and the lows yeah, and then yeah, sort yeah. of almost sort of into madness. Well, Dame Marie Bashir, who was governor of New South Wales when my biography was first published in 2013 and very kindly wrote an introduction in the book for me and launched the book at the Parliament House in New South Wales. And in her prior life, she had been a professor of psychology. And she said in her introduction, I suspect that from what we've read about him, that Henry was a manic depressive. Right. As Charles Dickens, they believe, was probably was too. And it's characterised by this enormous energy working 18, 19, 20 hours a day or right through the night and then lapsing into dreadful depression when things go wrong, and then coming fighting back again, a real roller coaster ride because it was undiagnosed in those days and there was no treatment for it. And so uh, all those around him went on this roller coaster ride with him. 
Yeah, yeah. But he was a big picture person, wasn't he? Oh, he, he was. Saw the, he saw the big picture yeah. of New but South Wales and visionary. obviously of, of Australia. To give you an example, in 1854, 58, he's a Member of Parliament and finally people are starting to talk about him as, oh, he could be a future Premier. We didn't have Premiers. The title of Premier wasn't official until 1920 in New South Wales. They even called the Head of Government the Prime Minister in the colonies at, at that point. The well, first. New South Wales was so full of itself that they would often name things as the Australian this, the Australian that, oh, they? or the National. You oh, know, well, the- Sir Henry was guilty of that. He, <laughs> yeah. Let's have the National Gallery here in Sydney. Here, that in was Sydney, one, yes. Yeah, that was one of his ideas. <laughs> and he wanted a free public Bit library. Bit of New South Wales overreach there, but anyway, yeah. as someone who's not from New South Wales. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, nothing much changed. No, it remains I, no, I, to this day. I, I, I'm a Sydney sider of 22 years, <laughs> so, so I love Sydney, New yeah. South Wales. But if he finally gets a ministry in 1866 in James Martin, later Sir James Ministry, and he gets the colonial secretary portfolio, and that covers really interesting subjects. So it's basically home affairs, it's police, it's hospitals, it's uh, land sales, it's uh, education. And these are areas that he's got these ideas on. So he brings in an education act, the first education act in New South Wales, which very quickly gets the Catholics offside because he says we're going to have public schools, but no religious school can be situated within five miles of it. You will get state colonial financial assistance, Mr. Catholic school or Anglican school or whatever, Presbyterian school, but you've got to have the same curriculum as the state school, you've got to have the same textbooks, and you can only teach religion for one hour a day. Well, of course, the Catholics just up in arms. And from that point on, the Catholics of New South Wales detested him. They thought he was the devil incarnate. What was the basis of this position? They said he was prejudiced against them. Uh, And was he? No. It was just ultra secular. He was an egalitarian through and through in everything he did. I want everything to be equal for everybody. So everybody should have the same type of education, the same standard of education. And that's why a very wise idea, the same curriculum, same textbooks. So the kids who went to different schools are still learning the same things and taking the same skills out into the world. And, uh, but he wasn't persuaded that if you are a Catholic parent, you might have an interest in a Catholic element to your child's education and that would be your choice. He never saw that. He was not a religious man himself. No. And when but then th- he was imposing his secularism on other people. Uh, without doubt. Yeah. Without doubt. And then the final straw for, for Catholics was 1880. He brought in one of his five times his premier. He brings in a new education act which withdraws all finance for Catholic and other church schools. So he's really in trouble. And to show you how long-lasting that was, when this book, my book, The My Biography of Sir Henry Parks, was published in 2013, the Byron Bay Writers Festival, lovely folk there, invited me to do a special event to talk about the book. And they said, by the way, Mungo McCullum wants to come. I said, oh, that's lovely. No, Mungo McCullum, he left us 2020, unfortunately, was a great political commentator, author, lovely man. But beware, Stephen, they said, he's a Catholic and he hates Henry Park, so be ready. Okay, so when my wife Louise and I arrive, we do the function and there's a packed room and I see, I had not met him before, but of course I knew what he looked like. I've seen him on TV and in the papers. He's sitting at the back with his arms folded, teeth gritted. And as I'm sitting down, the, the interviewer says, oh, by the way, Stephen, Mungo wants to have uh, dinner with you afterwards. Are you up for it? I said, oh, why not? So <laughs> the of us had, had dinner with Mungo later. So as the hour, hour and a half is going, I see him loosening up a bit and then we sit down and he comes and sits beside me and he said, well, Stephen, I've got to tell you, my grandparents hated Sir Henry Parks. They said he was the devil incarnate. My parents hated Sir Henry Parks and so I hated Sir Henry Parks. But he said- uh, Intergenerational and, hatred. Yeah. So yeah, we're talking 2013, 2014. Yes. And he said, but I have to tell you, all I've learned about Sir Henry, he hadn't written the book, all I've heard from you tonight about Sir Henry tells me that maybe he was misjudged because, yes, okay, as you say, it was a totally non-religious point of view that he had and it maybe it was prejudiced against the religious schools. But he said the other things he did, for example, he pushed throughout his career for women to be involved in politics, mm. for women to have the vote. And he said any man who says that a woman shouldn't have the vote is not a true Democrat. So he pushed for women's rights. And then in 1866, as soon as he becomes minister for the first time, and he's brought in his Education Act, a new Electoral Act, he legislates for the first time that there'll be 170 municipal councils throughout New South Wales. There'd been no such thing prior to then. All these things that he'd been busting to do and he'd seen the need for. And he sees there's one hospital in Sydney, the Sydney Infirmary, and it has all male nurses, quotation remarks around nurses. They're just attendants. They're just people that wheel you in and wheel you, wheel you out. So he writes to Florence Nightingale, who has become famous during the Crimean War as the mother of nursing. 
Dear Florence, would you be good enough to train four of your nurses and send them out here? We'll employ them to uh, work in the Sydney Infirmary and train female nurses in Australia. Letter comes back. Dear Henry, I'd be pleased to do that, but I don't think you'll need four. You'll need six. I will send you six. (laughs) So she sends him six nurses, headed by Lucy Osborne, who was 32, and she arrives with the nurses. And he pretty much throws them into the deep end. Their salary is being paid by his government, but that's he's. You know what you're doing. You've been trained, Florence. By the best. Yeah. Yeah. She'd spent 18 months training them for the colonial experience. But they found that doctors wouldn't work with them, male doctors, of course. Other tendons of the hospitals wouldn't work with them or ignored their instructions. After 12 months, four of the six have resigned and gone home to England. And it's just Lucy and one other left. But fortunately, in that year, they'd trained 12 local girls. And the next year, 24. And so it went. And Lucy, to her great credit, so if you talk to people in the nursing community and who know anything about the history of it in Australia, they'll immediately cite Lucy Osborne as the mother of nursing in Australia. In Australia yes. The Sydney Infirmary, which was in Macquarie Street, Sydney Hospital, right next door to Parliament House, she had a male administrator put over her who had no medical training whatsoever. So anything she wanted, if she wanted pillows for this or she wanted whatever it was, he would say no. And for seven years she struggled with this man who wanted to get rid of her. He didn't think women had a place in hospitals, as so many doctors didn't. So finally he left and the government put her in charge of all nursing. And this was Henry Parks' government. This was Henry Parks' government. Yes. This is one of the five times he was Premier. Yes. Yeah. Or Prime Minister. He was Prime Minister, (laughs) yes. Second time he's knighted and he gets two knighthoods for the price of one. And so he's now Sir Henry. And within two months of the Florence Nightingale nurses being in Sydney, Prince Alfred, the son of Queen Victoria, arrives as captain of HMS Galatea for a long stay in Sydney. Huge crowds to welcome the son of the and Queen. And this was the first member of the royal family to visit the colony of New South Wales, the, yes. the, the continent of Australia, mm. wasn't it? And he so was, it was a very, very big event. Oh, huge. Everywhere he went there, and they, every town and every area wanted to put on functions for him, so he's here for months. Because it's not until 1954 that we even get a visit from... The monarch, the, the, the monarch, and that's of course the queen. Yeah. So we waited a long time. Way long time. <laughs> so Henry welcomes him, of course, and, and puts on official functions for him. So there's a picnic, yeah, you know, with thousands of people at Clontarf Beach, and an Irish Republican a supporter walks up to him, shoots him in the back, and so who looks after Prince Alfred in the Sydney Infirmary? It's Lucy Osborne and the nurses. Oh, uh, sent out by Florence Nightingale. Wow. Well, so, I mean, there's lots to unpack about this story, but firstly, the fact that Prince Albert, well, there's an attempt Prince on Alfred, his yeah. life. Yeah. Sorry, Alfred. Yeah. yeah. Albert was he dead? There was an attempt on his life in Australia during his well, oh, course, mate, in his world, visit. Was world headlines. Sca- you know, huge, huge, huge event. Horror He lives, doesn't he? Because he's saved by his metal braces. Yes, yeah, so where the braces join, there's a brass but, connector and the bullet actually hits that through his shirt and jacket. It's an Irish Republican who yep. does this. I mean, what, what are the consequences of this? People jump on him, he can't escape and yeah. disarm him and he's thrown in jail and he's tried. So Henry gets involved because he's Minister for Police amongst his many portfolios at this point and he takes charge. He thinks he's going to be Hercule Poirot and he actually interviews the guy in prison and he became convinced that there was a Fenian conspiracy. The Fenians were IRA precursor. And their intentions were, if we can't get what we want through legitimate means, we'll use violence. Yeah. So this guy initially says, I was on my own. And then he says, there was a group of 12 of us and one blab, so we bumped him off. And I was going to shoot the prince from a hotel window on such and such a date, but I was worried I'd hit some other people, so I waited to get closer to do it. So the consensus today among most historians is, uh, you know, who knows something about the subject, is that this guy was crazy. But So Henry... So the day he died, he said he wasn't crazy. And he was convinced that there was this group of Fenians which had initially gathered in Melbourne and sent this guy to Sydney to do the deed, that he had a, at least one helper on the ground. And then he went to Kiama. So Henry was finding it difficult to be elected in Sydney because there was so much competition. So he'd go to country districts and be elected there. So he, he held quite a number of seats, didn't he, in the end? Well, in those days, if you lost in one seat, you could rush to another seat and stand there. <laughs> <laughs> Quite flexible. Just back, though, to the assassination attempt of Prince Alfred. After this, Henry Parks, as colonial secretary, as mm. we're saying, he passes the Treason Felony Act mm. of 1868. Well, his, pretty, his premier does. His premier does. But pretty, he supported it. 
Yeah, but this is pretty brutal clampdown on people's freedoms, absolutely, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, he's banning freedom of assembly, banning utterances against the Queen, making them illegal, basically imposing martial law in New South Wales. If you were Irish, you weren't able to send money in or out of the country. Yep, yep. He would said later, this was James Martin's doing, and he stood up oh, against so he him. distanced himself from this, did he? But Martin yeah. cunningly said, you're the minister, you will... Put it in your name. Yes, yeah. you'll present the bill to Parliament. So they fell out after this, so he resigned. Before we get on to Henry Parks's role in the Campaign for Federation and, of course, the famous Tenterfield oration, as Premier of New South Wales, Prime Minister of New South Wales, he has some incredibly significant achievements. I mean, the one that I thought was most impressive is passing the Act that made it compulsory for children aged 6 to 14 to attend school. So this was the 1880 Act, yeah. the one where he took the funding away from the... For, yeah. But up, that, up I mean, then that's, it hadn't that's been compulsory. Fantastic. But then the other thing I thought was interesting is this competition he launched okay. for a biological cure for the rabbit plague that was ravaging farms in Australia in the late 1880s. As described in my award-winning book, Pasteur's Gambit. Yeah. So tell me about this international competition for the biological cure for the rabbit plague. So there had been a competition run in France yeah. for a some sort of landmark to be built for the Paris exhibition. And the winner was Gustave Eiffel and the Eiffel Tower was the result. And they'd had many entries from around the world. And Parks takes note of this and says, we've got a big problem with the rabbit plague. It was felt a billion rabbits were running riot in the Australian colonies. And it wasn't only in New South Wales that was suffering. New Zealand was also having a problem. And he said, let's have international competition because he'd read a lot about Louis Pasteur's work and the great French microbiologist. Let's have an international competition and we'll invite each of the colonies to send representatives to sit on the judging panel. This was the first time the colonies had ever worked together to do anything. As we know, New South Wales and Victoria had different competing rail gauges. <laughs> you had to get yes. off the train at Albury to, because there were different gauges. And yet they would not collaborate on anything. But Lo and behold, all the other colonies said, yeah, well, the problem's big enough. We'll do that. And one of the reasons was the single biggest source of income for the colonial governments at that stage was the sale and lease of crown lands. And some of the most marginal lands, particularly in Western New South Wales, was crown land. But the rabbits were making it less than marginal because rabbits right down to the roots, they eat nothing. And it all started with Thomas Austin, who at Barwon Park, now, on Christmas Day, 1859 in Victoria, sorry, Victoria, but that's all you're doing, <laughs> uh, 24 rabbits, five hares and 72 partridges for a spot of sport so they could go hunting. Well, those 24 rabbits turned into a billion within, what was that, 20 years, 20, Amazing. 30 years. Yeah. And because rabbits do what rabbits do, they multiply yeah. rather quickly. Yes. So the colonies then employed what they called rabbiters. And rabbiters would go around and they were paid a bounty for every scalp, rabbit scalp. And so through the summer, they'd go around hunting the rabbits on horseback. They put baits down rabbit burrows. They chased them with shotguns. They came up with it. All machines were invented, steam operated machines to exterminate rabbits. There's a whole industry, anti rabbit industry. So much so that New South Wales had a rabbit minister whose only job was to get rid of the damn rabbits. Because a lot of these farmers in Western New South Wales are saying, we're not going to renew our leases no. because we're losing money. You've yeah. got to get rid of the rabbits. But the problem with the rabbits, as Sir Henry found, was that they'd leave two or three mating pairs behind each time they went through an area. Oh, yes, yeah, so they didn't want to put themselves out of business. Exactly, so yeah. they had a job the next year. Yeah. So um, he thought, I'm reading about this microbiology fellow, Louis Pasteur. Mm. I do hope he entered. They got 1,500 entries to the international competition from all around the world, and sure enough, one was from Louis Pasteur, as Sir Henry had hoped. And Pasteur wrote, I'm sending a team out yeah. because the terms of the competition – as it became. The prize was worth more than $10 million in today's money. Amazing. And yeah. it was just the thing that Pasteur needed. Pasteur refused to take government money, so he built his Pasteur Institute in Paris, but he'd run out of money. And he refused to take the government money to employ the staff and equip. So he's got the buildings, but he hasn't. He can't put anybody or any machinery in his Pasteur Institute. And he says, this is 10 million, well, 25,000 pounds it was. Set us up for years. Mm. So he's convinced he's got the remedy. He'd stumbled on the fact that he could poison accidentally in the laboratory, he poisoned rabbits that he was using in other experiments. They caught chicken cholera, as it was called. It's got nothing to do with the cholera that's fatal to humans. 
A lot of people were terrified when they heard about this. <gasps> we're all going to get cholera, but unrelated. So he sends his nephew, Adrian Loire, and protégé, and two others out, to claim the prize. I want you to come back with the money within six weeks, even though the competition rules said it's got to be tested for 12 months. Oh. And so begins this huge battle. And the two most senior members from New South Wales on the judging committee, followers of Robert Koch, Robert Koch would win the Nobel Prize for medicine for what turned out to be a failed invention, and they were bitter enemies. And Robert Koch invented what he called bacteriology. Pasteur invented microbiology. And so there are these two camps, the Koch camp, pardon my French, and the Pasteur camp, microbiology versus bacteriology, both exactly the same thing. Right. <laughs> and uh, these, these two Koch followers, Robert Koch followers on the committee, one was a doctor and a local member, decided to sabotage Pasteur's. Oh, no. Yeah. So Koch wins the competition? No. No? No. Because the way that to sabotage it, so Henry set up a laboratory on Rod Island in Sydney. You, know, you still can't visit Rod Island today because the remains of the laboratory are there. Special days during the year, you're allowed to go there. And he said, because he so wanted Pasteur's remedy, because he was convinced, and that everything shows today that it would have worked, I was so convinced that this would work and wipe out the, the rabbits, that he put Adrien Loire, Pasteur's nephew, on the island to, to carry out his experiments in view of the competition judging panel. But Pasteur's men would not release their samples. They had brought this chicken cholera out mm -hmm. to Australia, uh, to New South Wales. Edwin Loire had test tubes strapped around his waist because they survived at 37 degrees body temperature. So, oh, right, so yes. No one knew on the boat when he came out. He's carrying yes. <laughs> this. Is, yeah. But he wouldn't release his samples. So they sent to Robert Cock. Robert Cock sent a guy out with his sample so they could carry out their opposition experiments to prove, disprove, so they said, Pasteur, but they died en route. Oh, no. Yeah. But the Victorian chief judge, he happened to be the biggest importer of barbed wire in Victoria and he made a fortune from it. And, of course, what did he propose? No, we don't want microbiology. We want rabbit-proof fences. Ah, so did he win? That the rabbit-proof fence won. It, okay. That's how Australia okay. got rabbit-proof fences, so-called rabbit-proof fences, yeah. as a result of this competition. And we because, could have had Louis Pasteur's yeah. chicken cholera. And Pasteur set up the second Pasteur Institute in the world in Sydney on Rod Island and it, because his clever Adrian Loire nephew found that Cumberland disease, which was a disease in stock in New South Wales, was actually anthrax, okay. and his uncle had come up with a vaccine for anthrax. Yeah. So he was able to experiment and show that it, Cumberland disease with anthrax and the vaccine worked, he was able to send back more money than the $10 million in today's money that he would have earned from. So everyone was happy, oh. although and we so still ended is, up with the rabbits. Yeah, so. <laughs> we kept the rabbits, we got the, yeah. the fences. <laughs> and we dealt with Cumberland disease. Yeah. To Federation, Stephen, yeah. Henry Parks is known as the father of Federation. It yeah. is sad he doesn't get to see it to fruition, but yep. he's an old man by the time he dies. He doesn't die before his time, but he wanted to achieve a lot in his long life. Tell me about his involvement in the campaign to Federation. So, so his first official speech was in 1867 in Melbourne, and the people at the Intercolonial Conference were well received. Yes, yes, it's something we should be thinking about, and the press reported it well. But there wasn't really a movement for it other more pressing priorities, yeah. but he could see that it was the way to go. And so everything he did was with that in mind, and like what, yeah, the rabbit competition. And that was 1887, 88. So wherever he went, he would make speeches advocating it. So you mentioned the Tenterfield oration. That was in October 1889. At that stage, he's representing Tenterfield. He's the member for Tenterfield, and he's on his way to Brisbane and back for a meeting, and he gives this speech where he firmly advocates that yeah, this is the only way for the future of the colonies. We've got to work together and it's time we became a single nation. Yes, there's a, a lovely quote of his speech where he says, Surely what the Americans have done by war, Australians can bring about in peace without breaking the ties that hold us to the mother country. Absolutely. So he has a strong following across different parties. Eventually, political parties did emerge in the 1890s in New South Wales because they finally legislated that members of parliament would be paid. Up to that stage, 
one of the reasons Sir Henry kept going broke so often was because he couldn't rely on a parliamentary salary. It was only when he was a government minister that he had a, a salary. But he was paying for his daughter's rent. He was paying for his sister's rent back in England. And his wife and he had separated, so she's paying her rent. He's got expenses coming up. And oddly, when it was put up in Parliament and strongly backed in that members of Parliament should be paid, you know, ordinary members, he was against it. He never said why. I suspect he didn't want to be seen as personally profiting as much right. as, as much as he needed it. But of course it came in and that allowed people to stand for the Labour Party. Ordinary tradesmen, up to then you had to have a separate source of income to be a member of Parliament. And Parliament sat from four in the afternoon, often right through the night. So you had to have independent means to be a member of Parliament up until the, the 1890s. Yes, yeah. So he's advocating for federation for years. Mm. I mean, you said he first advocates for it in 1867. The Tenterfield oration is 1889, so it's 22 years on. Mm. He is clearly one of the sort of leading voices in favour of it. How much credit can we give him for the fact that we ended up with a federation of the colonies of Australasia? He has been called the father of federation, I think rightfully so, because he was unrelenting and even when the movement faltered yep. in New South Wales, he handed the baton to Edmund Barton, who was in the protectionist party, a free trader. And so they were on the opposite side. It's like Labor versus Liberal today, totally different political ideologies. But Barton was very much in favour of federation. And he was a young man, a younger, much younger man, and he was fit and able to go around. He gave 300 speeches in a year, Barton. Wow, uh, that's a lot of speeches. Yeah, on federation. <laughs> very few days off. <laughs> yeah, because Sir Henry, he was ailing he knew that his time was running out. Lord Tennyson was convinced that Parks was going to be the first Prime Minister of Australia, but he had no idea how unwell uh, Parks really was. But also Parks, he gave many speeches as well and initiated the Federation Convention, Constitutional Convention meetings, which took place in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Hobart, and they started discussing what the constitution of the new country would look like. And this is in, in the 1890s, so it's a decade in coming. And he's very influenced, of course, by America and how the American Republic had been yep. established. So it's interesting some of the ideas he puts forward. I mean, having a Senate. A Senate, um, a House of Representatives yes, is the lower house. Yeah, yeah. It, he wants an elected Governor General at yes, one stage. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, very Americanized. So if you wonder where we got our Senate from, it was Sir Henry Parks's idea. But his failing health meant that he couldn't carry it through to the end. Yes. Well, I presume he was very happy up in heaven somewhere oh, <laughs> with the happened, result. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Tell me, though, why is it that we don't know much about Henry Parks, given the significance of what he did for New South Wales, but also for well, Australia? Ask Australians who was the first president of America, and a lot were so. George Washington, who was the first prime minister of Australia? Who was the current Governor General of Australia, who's our governor? Who's your state governor? Yeah, ninety nine percent of people couldn't answer these questions. Australians, just get on with it, guys. We elect you. Go and do your you know. utilitarian. Yes, yeah. and sadly, I find younger people are not much in these days, not much more interested in anything that happened before they were born. And again, use the word history, and that's what I was taught at school. I'm, the shades come down, and I've advocated for years that we should have more movies and TV series based around our history. And in the 60s and 70s, there were a lot, Eureka and you know, Rush about the gold rush and what have you. And talking to leading producers, even today, they say, no, nah, Australians are not interested in history. Period drama is way too expensive. I think that the history of the United States of America, their independence was born through blood and war. Yes. It was a hard-fought independence. Australia's has been sort of a gentle evolution and some might argue we're still not independent given the king is our head of state exactly. but we don't have the drama which perhaps doesn't lend itself then to a blockbuster tv show yeah. or movie yeah. but and, you know what we don't, what? Have, That's, we don't that... have colorful characters we don't have hamiltons well, we or jeffersons or we Washington. do in henry park exactly. so well stephen thank you so much for joining me on afternoon light i hope we have brought to light the color of Sir Henry Parks, who really is a figure that needs much more attention paid to him for his enduring contribution to our country. Thank you very much. And, of course, Parks in Canberra is the area and the, the town of Parks are named after Parks. But With the Great t- Elvis Festival. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. I wonder what do you think of that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Pleasure. 
That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 